We're going to look this morning about a passage of Scripture found in the book of John, chapter 5, verses 39 down to verse 42. Brother Nathan read in our hearing just a few moments ago about this. And if you look at the title of our lesson, How Do We Have the Love of God Within Us? I think that's important, isn't it? To have the love of God within us and in ourselves because that's exactly what we need to have for salvation and everything that God wants us to be and to serve Him, to have that in our lives. In John chapter 5, Jesus was talking to the Jews here who were not followers of him. And the context states that, the fact that he's talking to some, as he says here, you search the scriptures, verse 39 tells us. For in them you think you have eternal life. And these are they which testify of me, that you are not willing to come to me, that you may have life. I do not receive honor from men, but I know you, that you do not have the love of God in you. That's why I chose to talk about this lesson. Because here Jesus is saying, you don't have the love of God in you. You're not following me. You're not listening to the words and, and, and doing them. As these would say, those who hear his words and do them are like those who build upon the rock. So we can look at that today, this last statement. But I know you that you do not have the love of God in you. And so for that reason, it's important, isn't it? I will suggest first of all this morning that it is a choice that we make based upon who God is. Have you ever thought about that? The time that you decided to serve Jesus and, and serve God. And why was that? Because as the Bible tells us, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Romans 10 verse 17 tells us. And a lot of things we understand come from God's word, how we come to faith in this. And the more we learn about God, like times like this on Sunday mornings when preachers are preaching and teach, Bible class teachers are teaching the Word of God, the more we learn about God, the more we should love and appreciate Him. Take your Bibles to Psalm 113, if you will. I want to read that whole song. In Psalm 113, the psalmist David, we're going to come back to David several times in this lesson, because David illustrates it, how we can have the love of God within ourselves as well. Notice what David says. The Lord, he says, praise the Lord, verse 1. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forever. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. The Lord is high above all nations. His glory is above all, above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God, who is enthroned on high, who humbles himself to behold the things that are in heaven and in the earth. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with the princes, with the princes of his people. He makes the barren woman abide in the house as a joyful mother of children. Praise the Lord. I want to tell you, that's written by someone who knows God, who knows what he does, and even we can even say that what he continues to do. And I think this is from an Old Testament perspective, of course, and we understand David is writing of his experiences and his knowledge of who God is. Well, I believe we need to have that same type of understanding of what God does. And I believe he, as we understand, oftentimes, He's the one who helps us in our lives more than anything else. That God is a God of love, a God of compassion and mercy and forgiveness, long-suffering and goodness. And we can go on and on about all the characteristics of God. And we have talked about those in other lessons. Take, for instance, what, Psalm 86. Let's go to that one as well. <clears throat> I want to read about some of the words of David this morning because you'll see it in the lesson. I've chosen to look at him to help us this way. In verse 1 it says, Incline your ear, O Lord, and answer me. This is actually a prayer of David. He says, For I am afflicted and needy. Preserve my soul, for I am a godly man. O you, my God, save your servant who trusts in you. Be gracious to me, O Lord. For to you I cry all day long. 
Make glad the soul of your servant. For to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. For you, O Lord, are good and ready to forgive, and abundant in loving kindness to all who call upon you. Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer. Give heed to the voice of my supplications. In the day of my trouble I shall call upon you, for you will answer me. There is no one like you among the gods, O Lord, nor are there any works like yours. All nations whom you, you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord. And they shall glorify your name. For you are great and do wondrous deeds. You alone are God. Teach me your way, O Lord. I will walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your, your name. I will give thanks to you, O Lord my God, with all my heart. And will glorify your name forever. I want to think about as we read this. He's extolling what goodness and the praise of God and rightfully so. And we can still say that today. Verse 13. For your loving kindness toward me is great. And you have delivered my soul from the depths of Sheol. O oh God, arrogant men have risen up against me. And, and a band of violent men have sought my life. And they have not set you before them. But you, O oh Lord, are God of merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness and truth. Turn to me and be gracious to me. O oh, grant your strength to your servant and save the son of your handmaid. Show me a sign for good that those who hate me may see and be ashamed. Because you, O oh Lord, have helped me and comforted me. Again, there's a lot of words we can center on about how God helps us even today. Now, he helped David in those times. I think he still has his heart toward his people in the New Testament in helping us today. And the evidence that these Jews had a known God or the love of God is in that they were not actually doing what God wanted them to do. In Matthew 23, verse 22. Remember, again, going back to the scribes, the Pharisees. He said, he said woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you pay tithe and mint and anais and cumin, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Now you can see the poem already. Here is God's people, but they're not fully God's people because their heart is really not. They're, they're more interested in the technical side of this. Make sure you've got all these, these herbs and all these things, the sacrifices right. But they've left out the most important thing. The idea of justice and mercy and faith. Notice what Luke 40, 11, verse 42 says. Here is parallel to what the Bible says in Matthew 23, 23. It says, But woe to you Pharisees, for you mint and rue and all matter of herbs, and pass by justice and the love of God. You know, how to have the love of God in your heart is being like God. You know, that's one of the things about being a godly person is that we are to imitate God. That we're supposed to be like him in those ways. And the Jews had not put two and two together. There was some disconnect there in their lives because of that. Because they didn't realize who God is is God of mercy. Then we need to be a God of a, you know, people of mercy and justice and love for others. But it's also a choice to love his ways. If we want the love of God in us, we've got to know who God is and make that the focus of our lives as well. As I mentioned, that's by all about imitating God in that way. In 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 14, the Bible speaks about how David was like this. You know why? Because Saul wasn't. Saul was deficient in his leadership and he had sinned. And here where Samuel is telling him, but now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart. The Lord has commanded him to be commander over his people because you have not kept the, what the Lord commanded you. Now we'll come back to this idea of not keeping the command. That's part of this as well. But it, it really is the attitude of heart and, and way of God's ways. You know what the commandments really are? They're leading us in the ways of God. When God says, don't lie, don't steal, and don't be dishonest and all the things the New Testament tells us. He's really trying, he's really trying to tell us. You need to be like me, a holiness, 
without the sin. And I know that's a struggle. That's always a challenge. Trying to be like God. In Acts 13 verse 20, Paul, when he was preaching there, gives us specifically who that would be as David. The Bible says when he removed him, he raised up for them David as king, removed Saul, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all my will. If we want the love of God in our lives, we've got to be like David in that way. Who's willing to do anything and everything that God says to do. It's really following his ways when we do that in that regard. And I believe it's a choice based on who we want to be. Think about that moment. What kind of person does God want us to be? And what kind of person do you want to be? Now, a lot of people in the world, they, they really are facing an identity crisis. You know, sin leads us that way. You know, sin makes us into something God never intended our lives to be. And really, that's why we have to struggle with sin to get out of the sin to really find out who we are in Christ Jesus. In John chapter 3, 19 and 21, notice what it says here. Here Jesus said, and this is the condemnation that light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen, that they have been done in God. I want you to notice there's a great contrast to me about people in the world today. There's people who love light, there's people who love darkness. And many times they are opposite of each other and they don't get along. And that's exactly the way because of sin or trying to follow Jesus. And those who love deceit, false ways, Air, hypocrisy, worldless, and all of that's really in, enveloped in the darkness, isn't it? And so all of that is people who want to be this way. They'd rather have sin rather than have a Savior. That's really the bottom line. Is it? You know, it's our choice. It's who we decide we want to be in this life that we live. We we're only given so many years to live here on planet Earth. We have to decide. What kind of person do I want to be? I want to be this dishonest, crooked person who has a reputation that you can't trust this person. Or I'm going to be a man of high moral fiber or a woman of high woman of high moral fiber that says, you know, what I mean is yes is yes and no is no. There's no deceit found in our lives when we do that. In Psalm 25, verses 4 through 10, Notice what David again says. Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. I want to stop there and say this. This, coming from David, shows his heart. That's why he was a man after God's own heart. Because he had a love for God and a love for his ways. If we want the love of God within us, we've got to be the same way. We've got to be able to say these words and mean those words ourselves today. That says, show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. On you I wait all the day. Remember, O Lord, your tender mercies and your loving kindnesses. For they are from old. Do not remember the sins of my youth nor my transgressions. He's letting go of that part of his life. He doesn't want to be remembered for that. It says, according to your mercy, remember me for your goodness sake, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he teaches sinners in the way. The humble he guides in justice, and the humble he teaches his way. All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth to such as keep his covenant and his testimonies. And I read all that because we still need that today, don't we? We still be reminded that this is the way of our lives, to follow God's ways in his past. Psalm 40, verse 16 says this, that all those who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. Let such as love your salvation continually say, the Lord be magnified. And I want to tell you, not everyone is willing to say that. Not everyone can say that. 
You know why? Because those who love sin, those who hang on to their sins, will simply stay. And so I don't want to say that because it's really not heartfelt and true in their lives. But I will say it can be. That's really the thing that you and I know is true because people can change. People can do differently. We're all living proof because we had all that sin in some ways, in some degree, we let sin in our life because for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And I want to tell you that the love of God in our lives and within us is shown by our hatred for sin. And we, I believe that a healthy hate for sin is a good thing in some regard. And I think that's because you know, people in the world say Christians should never hate anything. Well, that's not true because a hatred of sin will keep you out of doing things that God does not approve of. In Psalms 97 verse 10, here's the, the biblical proof of this, is that even from the Old Testament it says, you who love the Lord hate evil. There's an exclamation point on that, isn't it? He preserves the soul of his saints. He delivers them out of the hand of the wicked. And so people who love the Lord simply have to learn to not even like even a little bit the things of this world that are sinful. In Psalm 101, verse 3, the Bible says, I will set no worthless thing before my eyes. I hate the work of those who fall away. It shall not fasten its grip on me. In Psalm 119, verse 104, from your precepts, again, David's leading the city. From your precepts, I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. You know, David's a teacher even today, isn't he, to us? David is still saying things that need to be said to us, and we're learning even today from this. In Psalms 119, verse 163, David says this, I hate and abhor lying, but I love your law. Again, that's what we need to do. Instead of hanging on to sin, look at God's word and love God's word. Proverbs chapter 8, verse 13, written by David's son, Solomon, says this, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride and arrogance and the evil way, and the perverse mouth I hate. That tells us, again, what we should do. It's sad, but in the book of Amos, God had to remind his own people <coughs> to not to love sin, but to get back to faithfulness. You know why that was the case? Because they had left their faithfulness. They were no longer like David in a lot of ways, and the, the people of Israel, the uh, people of Abraham. And Amos 5.15 says, Hate evil, love God, establish justice in the gate. It may be that the Lord God of hosts will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. In other words, get back to faithfulness. Learn to hate the things that people are doing because that leads them out of that. You may think, well, all that's the Old Testament. Well, what are Christians today told to do? In Romans 12, verse 9. He says, let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor, that means to hate in a very strong way. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. So as we do that today, that shows again our love for God in our hearts. It's just demonstrated also by our action and our deeds as well. You know, when you love somebody, it ought to be more than saying, you know, I, I love you as lip service. It's also demonstrated, especially Valentine's Day is coming up. You know, we often think, well, you got to go out and buy flowers. You've got to do all these things to show a person that you, that you love, that you care for them. They ought to know that even without all that stuff. It's the things you do, all the things, the deeds that you do for them and show that appreciation. It should be more than say, well, I love you. I told you when we first got married and I'm... If I change my mind, well, I'll let you know. <laughs> It'll be something that we do every day. Now, I want to talk about this when it comes to God. When we follow the foremost commandment. Mark chapter 12, verse 28 and 30. The Bible says, One of the scribes came and heard them arguing and recognized them that he had answered them well. Well, I asked him, What commandment is the foremost of all? <clears throat> If you've got the ESV, it says this. What is the most important? The, the most important is, here O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord our God is one Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, 
with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. That's still what is before most in our lives today. Without that love, everything else is hard. I will tell you, if we don't love God more than the things of this world, it's going to be very difficult to do the things, make the sacrifices that we have to make as a child of God to live and properly serve Him faithfully because it will be conflicts, won't they? There will be times where I want to do this, but God wants me to do this, and then there's the, the challenge to do what's right. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, I want you to go back there because, again, I want to show how love is the first thing he talks about here. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 5 beginning says this, But thus you shall say to do to them, you shall tear down their altars and smash their pillars. For you are a holy people, the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen to be a people from his own possession. Verse 6 I want to begin with. Out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. The Lord your God set his love on you. Nor chose you because you were more in number than any of the peoples. For you were the fewest of all peoples. But because the Lord loved you and kept the oath which he swore to your father, forefathers. The Lord brought you out by mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery. From the hand of Pharaoh king of Egypt. Know therefore the Lord your God, he is God, the faithful God, who keeps his covenant with his loving kindness to a thousand generation with those who love him and keep his commandments. But he repays those who hate him to their faces to destroy them. He will, delay, he will not delay with him who hates him. He will pay him to his face. Therefore you shall keep the commandment and the statutes of the judgments which I command you to do, to do them. Then it shall be about because you listen to these judgments and keep and do them. For the Lord your God will keep with you his covenant and his loving kindness, which he swore to his forefathers, to your forefathers. He will love you and bless you and multiply you. He will also bless the fruit of your womb, the fruit of your ground. I'll stop there. What God is saying, these are conditional promises. You obey my words, keep your five commandments, my judgments, everything will be well. In chapter 10, he says this. Now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require from you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, love him, and to serve the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all your soul. I think we still can see that today, how Jesus would say in the New Testament. There's times when we realize God has not changed how he wants his people to act and behave. When it comes to how he, we look at God's laws in, in the New Testament age, you know. And we still have commandments today. Remember in John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. Later on, he talks about in John 14, 21 to 24. Jesus said, if God were, he talks about in John 14, this passage. I want to turn it over there. I don't have that on the chart. I thought I had that on the chart. In John chapter 14, we read about the time how people establish a relationship. You know, people often talk about a relationship with Jesus. How do you have a relationship with God and Jesus? You have it by following his words. <laughs> in verse 21, the Bible says, He who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I will love him and will disclose myself to him. And Judas, not as scary, said to him, Lord, what then has happened that you are going to disclose yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our abode with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words, and the words which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. And so, you see, if we want that relationship. We want to have God with us, especially when it comes to Having the love of God in our hearts. We do this because Jesus said, keep the commandments. I know a lot of people argue against that. So we're not under the commandments. Not like Moses' commandments. That's true. We're not under the law of Moses. We are under the law of Christ today. In 1 John chapter 2, it becomes very plain there. It says, by this we know that we 
Love the children of God when we love God and keep His, obey His commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. Now, you can't really say that in the Old Testament because a lot of ways they were burdensome. But in the New Testament, God has not put something too difficult for us to follow. When He says to assemble, to worship, that's not too difficult unless we have health issues or something hindering us in some way. But there's times when God asks to do simple things like study the Word, learn and grow, live by them, and serve them. Now, when it comes to the Jews, they weren't like that. You know why? Because they didn't keep the commandments. They were of the Father, the devil. He said, he said, if God were your Father, He would love me, for I came from God and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but He who sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? It's because you cannot bear to hear my word. Now, I'm going to tell you that right now. Listening to Jesus means everything. We want the love of God in our hearts. And these Jews Jesus talked to in John chapter 8, they didn't want to listen to Christ. They actually wanted to kill Christ, and they did put him on the cross later on. He says, it's because you cannot bear to hear my word. You are of your father, the devil, and, the, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character. For he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. That's a sad. We mentioned the contrast here about some who did not love and have the love of God in their hearts like we just mentioned here. <clears throat> The reason why. If we can't stand listening to God's word, if we simply say, I don't want to hear that. I don't want to go to church where, where people are, are talking about the things and the ways of God. Then that's a heart problem we have to, to work with. And I believe again we can change that. The last point of our lesson is this. It must be maintained by faithfulness. You know, God expects us to do our part in salvation. I know some people say God does everything, and He has done so much. What He's done for us is immeasurable. But it still requires us to do things, to be faithful to Him, to, to love Him, and to keep His commandments and such. And that's on our shoulders is to do our part in that way. And Jude reminds us of that in Jude verses 20 and 21. He says, But beloved, but you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith. Praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God. Let me stop there. Some might say, Well, how do I do that? How do I keep myself, keep our, ourselves in the love of God? It's really by maintaining the relationship. You could walk away from Christ. That's true. Many have. And that's not God's will for your life. He says, Waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. You know, obeying the gospel is just the beginning of your walk with Christ. It's something you do every day. The reason I chose that picture, and I, I sometimes put <clears throat> pictures on there that are appropriate. Every morning we wake up. You might wake up, you have your routine. I have coffee in the morning. What do you do with that time, that new day? What are your plans? What are you thinking about? What you're going to do that in school, work? Are we thinking about the Lord? Are we keeping ourselves in love with God by saying this is the day the Lord has made? Thank you, Lord, for this day. And help me to upbuild your kingdom this day. You know what faithfulness is about? It says, well, I obey the gospel, and I won't say this myself, I obey the gospel at nine years old. That's one reason I'm standing before you today because I obey the very early age you say, well, how can you be faithful till you get to your 70s? I'm 53 right now. You know how you can be faithful even to your old age? It's one day at a time. You get up in the morning, you're faithful. You say, doesn't that give you some kind of insecurity? Think you, well, you can walk away, but you do it things every day. That's faithfulness, isn't it? And today we decide to no longer be that way. That's a sad occasion that some, like Demas, the Bible says, have forsaken me having loved this present world. That's the problem, isn't it? 
It's about faith, faithful and purity and being unspotted from the world. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 14, remember what is taking place in 2 Peter 3. He's talking about the end of the world when Christ comes back. He's talking about when the heavens will be, will be melted and all the earth will be destroyed and everything will be taking place. All the works of men will be burned up. That's one thing that's going to happen, isn't it? He says, therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be a diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless. You know how to be found spotless and blameless? You do it every day. You don't go out and be out of character just even for a day <coughs> because that's not going to be found. You know, think about the day you decide to not be a Christian that day. So I'm not going to do it this day. Maybe the day Jesus comes. And we can be found in that way. I'm not trying to make this be fearful, but just be reminded that the Christian life is an everyday affair. It's not just one day out of the week. It's every day. And faithful in worship and praise to God. Hebrews 13, 15 says this. Through him, like Christ, then let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of our lips that give thanks to his name. Now, that's what we do today. We've come together with some song. We praise God in prayer and song. And however that is the case. Where does all that take place? It's at the sin. Remember what David said. Here's the words of David again in prophecy. I will proclaim your name to my brethren in the midst of the congregation. I will sing your praise. You know what God's will for our lives is? Is to be among the sin, worshiping, singing praises, and being faithful. That's how we have the love of God in our hearts. If you're here this morning, you're outside the body of Christ, Maybe you need the love of your God for the first time in your hearts in the sense of putting on Christ and being obedient to Him. It's by faith, isn't it? That we come to God in faith, but does it, does it stop at faith? We repent of our sins. The Bible commands repentance at 17, verse 30. And that we confess Christ with the Son of God, Romans 10, verse 10. Here the Bible says, Paul would say, For if the heart man believeth unto us, the mouth confesseth man unto salvation. When you put all these pieces together about what God says about salvation, it leads us to the last step, which is baptism. In water for the remission of our sins. There's where the Bible tells us we're buried with Christ, we're raised to walk in a newness of life. We can put away the old man, as Romans 6 tells us, and put on the new man, which is renewed in Christ. How we need to do that? This morning, maybe you need to respond to the gospel message of salvation. And put on Christ today. Why don't you do this together? We stand and we sing the song that's been selected.